Welcome. Good evening to everyone. Um, this is LexArt Inspires, which are our conversations with artists about life and the creative spark. My name is Wayne Davis. I'm the board chair here at LexArt and your host for this evening's event. Here at LexArt, our vision is to enrich lives and build community through the making of art and craft. And if you joined us a few minutes ago, you had a chance to see some of our upcoming events and opportunities where we bring art to the community and the community to art. So I hope you'll join us soon. Um, most of those things are online, but fingers crossed uh, in person, um, we'll all be able to get together very soon. Let us all hope. Um, we do depend on the generosity of our members and supporters. So if you enjoy tonight's program and wish to support our mission, we encourage you to visit lexart.org and click to donate. Tonight is the fifth in our series of LexArt Inspires. Um, so these are conversations that we have with artists about life, perception, creativity, and collaboration. Uh, while LexArt itself is primarily concerned with the visual arts, the creative spark knows no bounds. And so we are very pleased tonight uh, to hear from a pair of boundary crossing artists who work in poetry, playwriting, storytelling, and music. Um, we at LexArt are looking to get some, draw some inspiration from those other media. Uh, our guests will be telling us about where they find their inspiration and what it's like to create collaboratively, which is always a challenge and especially when the collaborators happen to be sisters. Uh, but I'm hoping that we'll learn from them. Most great art, uh, in my personal view, is, uh, comes from uh, both harmony and tension, and what better place to find that than within family and with siblings. <laughs> so maybe we'll hear a little bit about that. Please join me in welcoming Bundy Boyd and Anne Harding Woodworth. And what I'm going to do now uh, something that we've discovered in this series is a lot of fun. Rather than me telling you anything about their biographies, I'm going to ask B Bundy and Anne to introduce each other. I guess really I'm going to just introduce myself and then hand it over to Bundy. Um, I am Anne Harding Woodworth. It's really fun to be here and to see all you friends and um, friends of both both of Bundy and me and um, and of the of Lexart. Um, I am primarily a poet with an occasional foray into playwriting. And that's what we're gonna be talking about tonight. We wanna to talk about what got us to our collaboration. So we'll be talking about our careers. Um, my seventh book just came out a week ago. It's called Trouble. And it looks at all kinds of trouble, whether it's mental or physical or historical or sociological, whatever it is, it's, it's in there. Um, I think uh, that's enough about me right now. You're gonna find out a whole lot more during the program. So I'll hand it over to Bundy. I'm Bundy H. Boyd. Um, <laughs> I just go by the H, not the Harding. <laughs> and um, I've written seven plays. Um, two of them I've written original music with, and I've written two children's books. Um, Wayne can put up the first slide. Uh, one is called Milkweed is for Monarchs. That was my first one. And Milkweed is for Monarchs is about a nine-year-old who fights fiercely to save the milkweed for the monarchs, which is absolutely necessary. And it was beautifully illustrated by Gordon Hammond, the late Gordon Hammond, from Arista County, Maine. And my other children's book is Letter by Fairy Post, which is chock a block full of um, flower crowns and fairies and even a leprechaun. And this was um, whimsically illustrated by Deb Bellier, who lives in Surrey, Maine. And she is the former art teacher in Penobscot and Castine. And then my mu miscellaneous musical compositions I've put into uh, Songs for a Walk and my essays and short stories appear in um, Snows of Northern Bay and Light from Sheep Hill. Just because uh, Bundy and I, the collaboration on this play was the first time we had ever done anything like that doesn't mean we didn't collaborate. Um, as kids, we had a swing set and we, we uh, performed a circus on it. Um, we used to dress up in, in uh, 
<laughs> long clothes and write stories that went along with um, with those dress ups. One of my favorite, absolutely favorite dress ups was our grandmother Kate's, the dress she wore at my parents' wedding, if you can believe it. My mother <laughs> gave me the mother of the bride dress to dress up in and I wore that thing, a long chiffon dress for months probably. Um, we also uh, roller skated a lot and did performing, we performed on our roller skates. We had a playhouse, we had dolls, we would have tea parties in our playhouse and we'd invite our mother for tea in the playhouse. And then we got to be teenagers. <laughs> but believe it or not, I think we um, even charged our parents and the neighbors for those circus tricks, uh, a dime or a quarter, <laughs> highway robbery. As teenagers though, um, Anne and I played one piano, um, music. Uh, and one of our favorites was Ravel's um, Mother Goose Suite. And then we also played eight hand music with our own mother and, um, and our sister Molly Harding Nye, who many of you know from Lexington. Let's see, we played March Militaire by Schubert and Hallelujah Chorus by Handel. That was really fun. And I accompanied Anne on her songs because she loves to sing. And she and I would sit at two pianos and for a long time, we would just improvise whatever came out. It was lots of fun. But what you might ask got us to collaborate on our play Somewhere Voices. That's what we're going for tonight. So for our adult lives, both Anne and I have pursued our writing separately. I was writing my music and my short stories and my plays. And I was writing my poetry. In the late seventies, I was living in Athens, Greece. Um, I was married to a Greek. Uh, I had two little boys. I wrote my first book of poetry. It was called Guide to Greece and Back. And um, this examined uh, my love of Greece, which I had and I still have, and as well as my um, homesickness for the United States while we lived there. Um, this ambivalence was sort of a theme of the whole thing. Here's a short poem from that book. Uh, that sort of exemplifies that ambivalence. It's a short poem uh, and you will recognize some old brands that you probably haven't thought of in a long time. It's called Maytag Hellenism. A church pillar, hold, uh, I'm hamburger helper. A church pillar holding up the Erechtheon carport of aluminum siding and New Orleans grill. I'm blue dot Ajax, scouring Socrates' bath, tubs, and sinks, and urinals, watching the youths move in trained muscularity from their car to Vic Tanny's introductory offer. I'm a comb in Penelope's hair after head and shoulders has molded her flaking scalp into marble metamorphosis. To separate is out of reach now, not the colors, hot and cold wash, rocks and rivers, nor the reality somewhere between. I'm a Vestal Virgin, vacuuming the next day into a disposable bag. Do we even know whether they um, sell help, uh, Hamburger Helper anymore? They do sell Hamburger Helper, but there are no Vic Tanny gyms anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so this is not the end of Anne's interest in vacuum cleaners, as you'll see later. <laughs> While Anne was living in Greece, I was and I'm still living in Penobscot, Maine, which is a um, very small town on the Bagadus River in Maine. Um, but I want to insert just a little vignette here. Um, in 1976, our parents came to visit Bob and me in Penobscot and my mother got out of the car and she had a, a black um, garbage bag, plastic garbage bag, and she deposited it on my front step. And in it were 29 notebooks. Um, that belonged to my grandmother, our grandmother, Kate Hall Bundy. But I will tell you about those later, so hang on to that thought. Penobscot, Maine is a very small town with a small element, elementary school, and I almost said elementary because some people say it that way. Um, and when my children went there, there were 100 students. I think there are about 75 there now. And uh, I volunteered at the library in the school a lot. And I also accompanied the, um, the March musical every year. But in 1986, I decided to write my own musical, which was the beginning of playwriting for me. And I adapted a book um, 
called Freedom Train. And it was by Dorothy Sterling. And it was about Harriet Tubman. And the, the, so the whole school did participate in it. And even the principal of the school played the role of Abraham Lincoln. And then the next play that I got interested in was Harriet Jacobs. Harriet Jacobs wrote Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, which is a harrowing um, tale of sexual harassment such that Harriet Jacobs felt that she had to hide from her master. So she hid in, a, in an attic crawl space that was only nine by seven by three feet tall. And so she wasn't even able to, um, to stand up in that hideaway. But she hid there, um, able to see her children through loopholes in the, in the roof wall that she had drilled. Anyway, um, my first song in this play, Hattie, is called A Woman and a Sister, and it's based on an 1838 token, half-naked woman kneeling and chained, and around the edge it says, am I not a woman and a sister? So the first song uh, appears actually in the beginning and the middle and the end with different words. And I'll just read a few of the um, lyrics that I wrote. Am I not a woman and a sister? Oh Lord, take my hand. Am I not a woman and a sister? Take me to the promised land. Have I not a woman's pride? With courage, Lord, save us all. Oh, see me through the darkest days, I can stand tall. Have I not a woman's love? Each precious life held near. My children born to me as slaves, I live in fear. So then in act two, scene three, Hattie comes down from her attic hideaway, which has the barest of loopholes that shed a little bit of light so that she can see her two children. Her two children, Louisa and Joseph, uh, were fathered by the white neighbor nearby. She sings um, a song of revelation because finally after four years, she spent seven years altogether in this hideaway. But this is about the fourth year. She decides that maybe she can have a life of her own when she can get out of there and is free. So she sings this song, which is called Loophole Light. Something powerful is happening, I don't know. A feeling in my head, feel it grow. It's a sense I never had my being. There is a path ahead I'm seeing. Something mighty strong is stirring in my heart. A spirit it is lifting, I can start to see through the clouds above a life my own. It's a power in myself I've never known. And then the chorus goes, oh, loophole light, it lights the world, a beacon for my eye. It's true light, it's pure light. It's light that spreads out wide. Oh, lupo light, my mind's astir with plans for time ahead. It's true light, it's pure light. I am alive, not dead. I am alive, not dead. It's hard for any of us to imagine living like this and for seven years. Well, Hattie escaped north eventually, and eventually her children followed. And Jacobs wrote her, this narrative. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have read the narrative but she wrote it with pseudonyms because she was afraid of being sent back into slavery. So in 1989, Jean Fagan Yellen produced a um, Harvard edition after many, many years of research. She found the, the, the real names of the characters in the play. So it really is an amazing story. And we look forward to the day when, when we'll see Hattie performed and sung on the stage. While Bundy was busy doing all that in the 80s, I was back in the US working for Chrysler Corporation, which um, was a lot of fun for me, um, but, and it did uh, feed my kids and um, give them shelter, but it wasn't too conducive to writing poetry. In 1991, I married again, a lawyer who absolutely loves poetry. He's, he has more poems in his head than memorized than I will ever be able to recite. And it was in, in uh, very shortly after we married, we moved to Washington, D.C. from Detroit. And um, in 19, well, D.C. turned out to be, is an absolutely wonderful city to do poetry in. It's, there's poetry wherever you turn. In 1997, however, I made my first venture into playwriting and I entered the Source Theater's 10-Minute Play Festival 
and I wrote um, a little play called Skin Play, and it actually won first prize. So that was my first venture into playwriting. And in 2002, Anne and I had a real collaboration, and we called it Sister Act. She was coming to Maine to visit me for a weekend, and a friend knew that she wrote poetry and suggested that she do a poetry reading, so she did at the now defunct um, Liberty School. So that weekend she was here in Blue Hill reading her poetry and I was down in Waldeboro, uh, Maine at the Waldo Theater because my play Coming Home uh, was being produced uh, there. It's about a, a quirky Irish woman who was rejected by her family and comes to America and her life takes odd turns. Um, and, and the uh, play Coming Home now has a new title. Uh, it's gone through lots of revisions and still is. And it's called A Wee Bit of Sense. Our sister, Our sister. Molly, whom many of you know, in her inimitable need to joke around, sent this picture up to Maine when Bundy and I did our thing together up there. Um, these two dorky teenagers with ridiculous hairdos um, she, I think Molly thought she was doing a little PR for the sister act that we were going to do. <laughs> it was our first six sister act, and it made us realize uh, that Bundy and I really did have a lot of fun do, write, talking about our writing together, thinking maybe there's some way we can collaborate. We weren't quite there yet, but we were on our way. In, um, in 2012, Anne Ames, who was the artistic director of um, Belfast Maskers at that time, arranged public readings of my Hattie play. And then she and I, Anne Ames and I, um, collaborated on writing a play for middle schoolers. And it was called um, Three Wise Men of Spider Creek. It's sort of along the lines of Little House on the Prairie about a farming family in rural Minnesota um, facing big challenges in the winter of the 1880s. And our play was given um, six or seven performances in, uh, in Lincolnville and Ellsworth and Searsport, Maine for area students. And it was around this time that I, um, my first chap book came out. It was early 2000s. The word chap comes from the old English for cheap. And it is a cheap way of getting your, public, your, uh, your poetry out there. It has no spine. And it's just, it only has about 20 poems in it or so. But Aesop's Eagles was in the voice of Aesop as he traveled around Greece. So also about this time, I was inspired to write a one act play based on the John Singer Sargent painting, The Daughters of Edward Darley Boyd, which is um, a prized possession of the um, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. There we are. It's an enormous uh, painting of the four daughters of Edward Darley Boyd and the vases on the other side are the original vases that you see in the portrait. This, the portrait itself is more than seven feet by seven feet. And Sargent and Boyd were close friends who painted and exhibited together. Um, the girls in the painting have been psychoanalyzed ad nauseum. Partly because of the nature of the painting, two of them seem to be sort of in the shadows and two of them are out in the light. Um, and also people just thought it was so strange that not one of them married, but they went on to have very productive lives. In my play, um, which is entitled Daughters Forever, the girls act out their lives on the day that John Singer Sargent comes to do his preliminary drawing. However, um, that preliminary drawing was never found. It, they thought it might be with the family. And it hasn't been. It wasn't in Sargent's studio. But all of these girls on that day in my play um, are rebelling against having their portraits painted. Uh, when in fact their father just calmly says, portraits are a necessary part of life. They add permanence to the ephemeral. And then there's a surprise twist at the end of my play. It's really a good premise for the, for the play. And, and um, that's another one we, we hope to see on the stage. But now let's go back to that, um, that black trash bag that our mother put on Bundy's front stoop. Um, Bun, tell us about that. So there in the black trash bag were 29 diaries that our grandmother Kate Hall Bundy had written 
between the years of 1891 and 1898 when she was 15 to uh, 22 years old. She was a very, very serious piano student. And um, it took me 30 years to transcribe those diaries, but there were a few more diaries too. And um, it was pure pleasure. I just loved every minute of being with my grandmother. She died when I was only four years old and was two. So this was my way of getting to know our grandmother. Um, and here's a slide of the three girls. Um, Kate had two sisters. And here is Bess at the top, um, who was a gifted violinist. And Agnes was a, um, a very talented um, cellist and a lifelong cellist. She played the cello until she was 100 years old. And that's- She's on, she's on the right. Um, she's on the right. And Kate is on the left, the serious piano student. The Bundy family originally was from a very small town in, in uh, Oxford, New York. Um, but I think it might have been their aunt, Elizabeth, who was a doctor in Philadelphia, who persuaded the family to move to Philadelphia so that the girls could have broader uh, musical opportunities. And the family was very financially restricted. So these girls started teaching music, teaching their instruments at very early ages, like 14 and 15. Plus they played in concerts and were compensated. So they really, really helped to support the family. One of the more lucrative engagements was playing for Mr. Mager, an invalid who loved classical music. So here's, here's one of Kate's diary entries, January 2, 1894, she writes, this evening we played for Mr. Mager and we took him a New Year surprise. Agnes, uh, she was only 14 at the time, went down with her cello and played a Haydn trio number eight with us and duet for violin and cello by Donkla with Bess. Agnes played very well indeed and the Magers were very much pleased. It is so lovely to think that each of us girls has her own instrument and can play together and give other people as well as ourselves so much pleasure. Kate gave her debut concert in uh, Philadelphia, the Academy of Music in 1895, January 23rd. And she played uh, Rubinstein's um, con uh, concerto in D minor with the Damrush New York Symphony Orchestra. And I play that in my car and I'm dumbfounded that she had the ability at 19 years old to play that very challenging concerto. It's beautiful. These diaries, after I transcribed them, were published in 2014. So here is Kate in her debut concert gown for volume one. And volume two is Kate as a mother playing her and wife playing her uh, Steinway Concert Grand, which is still in our family. And Anne's son, Alexi Lawless, has it with his family out in California. So Bun, where does our grandfather fit into all of this? Well, Kate had many, many suitors in Philadelphia. They were, it was like a revolving door in their house uh, with these three girls. There were boys coming in all the time at all hours and um, they pursued her even in Germany. So they, she had a lot of letters. So listen to this. This is her entry from Berlin for December 1st, 1897. This morning came a pile of letters from Papa Fanny, Mr. Sternberg, that was her Philadelphia teacher and Rodney Knapp. I opened Rodney's first, but I saw at first glance what it contained and had to leave it until the last. Poor Rodney, he has sent me a very boyish, but with all manly offer of marriage. He admits that to see me start off for Europe was too much for him. So now I have to write to him and cause him bitter disappointment. This means four proposals in the last three years. Each one makes me less inclined to marry. <laughs> oh, poor Rodney. Well, anyway, he didn't become our grandfather. <laughs> no, but um, we do have a we do have a slide of who did become our grandfather. Kate disappointed Rodney. Yeah. So no, he didn't become our grandfather. But here's Dan, who was an avid letter writer, and he did win Kate's hand. Although conflicted about marriage and a music career. Kate actually accepted his proposal and they married in August of 1901. Shortly after Bundy finished her work on the diaries um, and the original diaries, by the way, are now in the Hamilton College Library. 
um, Bundy and I had an honest to goodness collaboration. I had sent her some poems that, that hadn't been published yet. Um, and she chose one called Winter Night to set to um, music. And she said it, she made it into a, a, a song for three voices, soprano one and two and alto. And um, I'm gonna read the poem to you because it has, a, it, it was a lullaby and it was picked up by a website um, called Flock Lit and they were looking for lullabies. And I got some friends to um, record it with me. Uh, but I want to read you the poem first because the words are kind of hard to understand and they're unusual words for a lullaby. I thought of myself holding an infant in the middle of winter when the snow plows were out on the street making that rasping noise when sparks fly and, and it's very noisy and I was trying to get my baby back to sleep. It's called Winter Night. I will rock you. I will rock you. I will wreak silence on engines of the night, keeping air from fighter jets and propellers, all road to sirens, radios, and worn brake pads. I will guard the snowy streets from plows that in sparks rasp the pitch asphalt intruding into your sleep as they assault winter's soundless intention to turn surfaces into tender white contours to hide sly angles of distraction, sharp geometries. I will rock you, flush warm child, who's been woken by invention so that you will hear the song. So as I said, this was recorded and I think now we can listen to the song. I will rock you, I will rock you, I will some of um, any of the musicians who performed on that on, on the well, call? I thought Shereth was here, but I think she had to leave. She was one. I had, there were six of us women who um, recorded that in, in, in our living room and um, just friends of mine that I knew sang. So I'll just put a little note in here. Um, it was the musical talent of Kate and her sisters of the 19th century that really influenced and still influences Anne and me today with our creative endeavors. Yeah, I, I have written and do write many poems that 
incorporate music in one, one way or another into them. I'm a member of the City Choir of Washington, which is a chorus of 120 voices. Of course, we're not meeting right now. Um, and, uh, but uh, I'd like to, um, I know Bundy mentioned uh, something about my interest in vacuum cleaners. Our mother sang while she worked. And this, yeah, I mean, we all have seen vacuum cleaners like that in our day. And she, she loved hymns and she would vacuum with something just like that um, all over the house on some oriental rugs. So I have written a poem called Vacuum Cleaner 1950. My mother sang while she vacuumed. Oh God, oh, so she said, oh God, she always called him God. Oh God, help in ages past, sucked it in with her breath as if not wanting to hear herself. We heard her, her counterpoint to the upright's drone. We saw the bag inflated, smelled the must and pepper mix in the electric disturbance of our home. The war was over, but the lyrics were not self-instruction like the singing women do at looms where songs sing designs of weft and warp a count of color, flower, and medallion, a chanted mnemonic that becomes the poem, then the Persian rug. No, our hope for years to come knew no possibility of instruction or of art as the machine gnawed at wool knotted in Tabriz. My mother sang no more than for refuge, hymnal domesticity, deep within her fragile shelter from the stormy blast the cord, which she did not see as connection to anything, always in the way of her feet. I can hear our mother singing Faith of Our Fathers, vacuuming the next room's rug. And I find that I even hum or sing when I vacuum sometimes. So it must be in the genes. Um, maybe I'm putting myself in the shoes of our mother, just as I do with playwriting, where I step outside myself and into the characters. It's the same thing in poetry. When you put yourself into someone else's shoes in poetry, you're writing a persona poem, which is something I really enjoy doing. As I mentioned, uh, my Aesop, um, Aesop Eagles book, that's in the voice of Aesop himself. And I've written a book um, in the voice of the last gun on earth. This is my little chat book, see, no spine, uh, called The Last Gun. And this is Anubis, uh, Egyptian god of embalming with a, an assault rifle, and he is going to carry that assault rifle, he's going to embalm it and carry it across the river for burial. But he, being here at, with Lexart, I thought it'd be fun to read a persona poem that is not only a persona poem, but is what we call an anaphrastic poem. When you write a, something about a piece of art, as Bundy did with her play, Daughters Forever, you're writing in the genre of ekphrasis. Ode on the Grecian Urn by Keats you know, is, is a, an ekphrastic poem. And I wrote a poem based on a sculpture. This is a sculpture by Janice Redman. It's called Ouroboros, which is the word used for the, the snake that eats its own tail. Um, and this is a, seems to be a change purse that's eating itself. It's made of asphaltum, cotton, and metal, and I just love it. So I couldn't resist writing a poem about it. It's called Dance Me Full Circle. Ah, oh, come on. I know I'm a talker, but dance me, won't you? I know my maw's open all the time, but ah, oh, come on. I can cock it. Dance me, won't you? Swing time at sunset with music, just you and me encircling each other closing ranks like a morning glory at night. Ah, oh, come on, let's dance. Dance me when it's dark, won't you? When it's dark and dance is aching for more. And one more um, persona poem. Um, this one is from my book called The Eyes Have It, with a nice eye right out of an oil painting. Um, this poem, was chosen by a dancer named Charisse Hogue of Washington, DC, who also happens to be a fantastic poet. She adopted this poem as the accompaniment for a dance that she choreographed and danced. 
the poem is called Francesca's Song, and it's in the form of a villanelle. So you'll hear a lot of um, re repeated lines, and it only has two rhymes. And uh, but being having the, the rhythm that it does, it gives it's a it's it has musicality and it's conducive to dancing. It's in the voice of a woman dying, so it's a persona poem. Um, and I'm hoping that Wayne can get this um, on the screen so you can see Sharika dancing. Francesca's song. Come closer to my ears and eyes. Your mouth I want to see and hear. Speak out the sounds of willow sighs. It's never long to realize how good it feels to have you near. Come closer to my ears and eyes and fill my mouth with cubes of ice that help me swallow fever fears and listen for your willow sighs that emanate from deep inside your lungs and throat. Do come near, closer to my ears and eyes so I can touch your breath. I'll rise or try to meet you partway there and fold me in your willow sighs. I think sometimes of winged rides, but I'm not getting out of here. Come closer to my ears and eyes. I'll run my fingers down the sides along your cheeks, their tear veneer that speaks the sounds of willow sighs. Come closer now, my ears, my eyes. Oh, Anne, that's beautiful. I hadn't seen it with the dance. Oh. It does, that's a powerful image too, and it brings it into focus all the people dying today of COVID. Writing a play is like writing a cast of persona poems. You have to get into the body of several characters or just one if it's a one person show. I find myself sobbing and laughing and experiencing the emotions with my characters, which makes it all worthwhile. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and, and speaking of one person, sh one woman, one woman shows, one person shows, um, I have a long persona poem called Hannah Alive. It's in the voice of an 80 year old woman. She's a widow. Uh, her husband, Tony, has died, and uh, she's the mother of two. She's a sculptor. Um, she makes a small human figures, which she puts all over her house. And she's a member of a guild. But if this sounds like anybody you know in Lexington, this is pure fiction. She contemplates her past life and her future. I was writing this long poem uh, in Hannah's voice that I realized I was writing a one woman play. So I did indeed turn it into a play yet to be produced, but it's had two wonderful dramatic readings with a prize from the Adirondack Shakespeare Festival. Here's an excerpt from the poem, Hannah Alive. I got my own show at the Guild to exhibit my sticks, my skinny leggy figures. They called me a visionary artist because I was untaught except by studying Leonard Baskin, his dead men, his birds, his drawings of mortality, his owl, I placed my sticks all over the house we lived in then. I think the inspiration for Hannah's um, so-called sticks was our sister Molly's wonderful sculptures of the human form that can hardly be called sticks. They are absolutely gorgeous uh, human figures. And I want to show you one. This was Molly's Christmas present to me a few years ago. It's a young girl reading what we can assume is a book of poetry. And um, there's a bugle under her right thigh, near next to her right thigh, um, because Molly knows that I play the bugle and the trumpet. And this is one of my prized possessions. It's not very big. It's bigger than what I visualized Hannah doing. And it's a lot more beautiful than what Hannah does. But Molly also puts these all over her house, just like Hannah. And um, Molly also gave me one. This is, I, I call this um, Our Lady of the Auto Harp. Um, Molly found it a little difficult to um, make a piano <laughs> with this. So she did the auto harp. I was given an auto harp for Christmas. It was the only thing I ever wanted for that Christmas when I was about 12 or 13 years old. And I still have it and I still play it. So this is Our Lady of the Auto Harp. 
Hannah believed in birth control. And she goes on to say, in those days, people had two children. That was it, zero population growth, they called it, ZPG. Tony and I replaced ourselves with two boys. It made a lot of sense, still does to me, but others don't see it that way anymore. Well, speaking of big families, I've written a play in two acts about Margaret Sanger, that courageous woman who spent her life um, fighting for access to birth control for all women. So here she is in a photo. Sanger grew up in Corning, New York, uh, the home of the glass factories. And at a very early age, she was aware that the, um, the owners of the glass factories um, had very small families. And the workers all had very large families and they lived near the river and they had a hard time supporting all of these children. Furthermore, her mother had 14 pregnancies and 11 living children. And then on top of that, um, contracted tuberculosis. So her mother died at the age of 48. So these were big influences on Margaret Sanger. She was a wife and a mother of three children and as a nurse, she saw a lot of um, death and dying of women and babies, uh, women from botched abortions, um, babies from malnutrition and disease. And in 1916, she opened the first birth control clinic in America. It was in Br the Brownsville section of, of Brooklyn, New York, and uh, which was very populated and um, and at that time, uh, the Comstock laws criminalized any, any um, information that was shown, demonstrated, exhibited, or sold. Um, it was absolutely a crime to, to do any of that. So Margaret Sanger in her clinic was selling one of her, her booklets, which was called um, What Every Girl Should Know. So a plainclothes woman a policewoman came in, bought a copy and whammy. She was on her way to jail. And furthermore, they called her clinic um, a public nuisance. So um, she went off to jail, uh, but here's a dialogue that Anne and I will do for you, just a little bit of, of, of my play, um, which is called An Hour Struck. And the title is taken from a Victor Hugo quote, um, there is no force in the world so great as that of an idea when its hour has struck. So Anne is going to be the judge, I will be Margaret. Right, and you can bet the judge in, what was, What year was it, Bundy? Sorry. 1916. 1916? 17 actually. Wasn't, wasn't named Anne. Okay, <laughs> I'm the judge. Margaret Sanger, section 1142 of the Penal Code of New York's, of New York states it is unlawful to disseminate contraceptive information as you have done. You have violated this law by demonstrating and distributing articles for the prevention of conception. If you do as we say, the court can assure you leniency. Will you promise right here and now that you will operate, that you will not operate such a clinic? I can promise nothing. I'm solely interested in changing this abominable archaic law which prevents women from receiving information so they can space their babies, limit the size of their families. The law is the law and it applies to everyone until the law is changed. I cannot promise to obey a law I do not respect. Are we to assume then that it really doesn't matter to you what consequences you face? What matters to me is what happens to the women. Women and babies are dying because of this law. Margaret Sanger. You have violated the said law in question by establishing a birth control clinic where you have demonstrated, sold articles, and dispensed information for the purpose of preventing conception. It is the judgment of this court that you be confined to 30 days in the Queens County Penitentiary. At this point, the Brownsville mothers stand and shake their fists at the judge and say, shame, shame on you, judge and off she went for 30 days. Today, we're seeing the erosion of reproductive rights with many stricter laws put into place. Considering the, bar the barriers that, um, and the years that it took to gain access to birth control information for all women, um, we just cannot turn the clock back. 
Sanger's voice is needed more than ever today as a rallying cry. I think I got into this um, whole overpopulation thing with, with Hannah, um, being aware of Bundy's research that she was doing on, um, for, her, for her play, An Hour Struck. Um, and all the research she did on birth control. Hannah says, there are just too many of us in the world today. Too many people in spite of scourges, Ebola, HIV, earthquakes, tsunamis, COVID-19, tornadoes and wars, endless wars, hatred, killing human beings because of the way they think, pray, look or talk. And of course, guns, which are just another branch of war. If each one of us replaced our own self, we'd keep things pretty steady. And steady's good. Steady relieves the mind. Steady opens eyes. Steady quells jealousies. Steady makes room for peace. So this brings us to our collaboration on Somewhere Voices. Some of you saw the dramatic reading of our play in, on Zoom in August. We did it here in um, Blue Hill through the New Siri Theater. And they did a wonderful job. I came late to collaborating with Bundy on the play. Uh, I was aware that Bundy was working on a play um, that incorporated PTSD and the ravages of war and a lot of music and especially our grandmother's diaries. In fact, our grandmother Kate uh, was a main character in the play in spite of the fact that the date of the play is in 2014. Bundy would send the play to me periodically and um, I'd start, I'd get my pencil out and start moving things around. And then we'd get on the phone and we'd talk for hours saying, well, shouldn't this be this? And, then, and we added a few things here and there. We added songs and we were really having a lot of fun doing it. To the point that I felt that it was becoming a joint project and I asked Anne to be a co-author. Our son Sam had been a Lieutenant Commander in the Navy stationed in Afghanistan in 2007 to 2008. And when he came home, he had his share of adjustment difficulties as so many young people do today even. So the combination of an Iraq war veteran in the character of Rachel and a frustrated concert pianist now teacher, Marco seemed far-fetched, but their separate identities were worth, and struggles were worth pursuing. And then enter Kate, our pianist grandmother, as a voice from the 1890s. She added an intriguing part of the life puzzle. So Anne and I added some music. Uh, one was a very old spiritual called Heaven Bound Soldier, a folk song, uh, Barbara Allen, and an 1890s popular song called uh, Beautiful Isle of Somewhere. And we even had a bit of the, um, the first part of Tchaikovsky's Piano Concerto Number no. 1, and we had taps at the end. And did move things around, and she had fresh ideas, which I really, really liked and appreciated. So I finally persuaded her it was by both of us. <laughs> so that's the story of our collaboration. And I hope it's not the last one we do. The Zoom reading performed by the New Siri Theater in Blue Hill, Maine was just absolutely excellent. It was a very talented cast and I'm looking forward to a real stage production of it um, if, if COVID ever decides to leave us. Um, however, during COVID, Zoom has come into its own. And um, I, I think all over the world, people are discovering how wonderful Zoom is uh, during this period. Um, it's, I think it's even um, becoming a, a venue for drama. People are beginning to write plays just for a platform like Zoom. In Somewhere Voices, it was particularly um, easy to do Zoom because one of our characters was on Skype the whole time. So she was already um, in a frame on the, in, on the screen. Anyway, I, I see the day when plays will be written for Zoom. The most difficult problem we had with, um, with the Zoom was that we couldn't put on all of the music. So perhaps the meaning of the play got a little bit garbled at the end, but you could do that as a staged production and um, that could be very effective. So we could get all the music on it. So 
that pretty much gives you an idea of how we spend our time, what led up to our collaboration. It's been a lot of fun to be with you tonight. Thank you all so much for coming. If you have any questions, I hope they're in the chat and we can uh, handle some of them if there are any. And um, happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Well, thank we you so much for tuning in. Um, and be sure to come back for the December program, which I understand uh, Lexart has two musicians coming in December. That will definitely be a lot of fun. We do have a um, couple of questions already, and I would certainly encourage people to add some more in. So the, the first question actually is for you, Bundy. Um, a small detail you slid over the question is, so what's the relation with the Boyts of the Sargent painting? Um, Edward Darley Boyd was the great uncle of my husband, Bob. He, he was um, a brother to Bob's grandfather. So the daughters are, are the daughters are um, Jane and Florence, Louisa and Julia. Julia became a, a, a very, very fine um, artist herself. And the others did some art. Uh, one of them did leather work and silver work and they had productive lives. And so they were the cousins of Bob's father. Oh, wonder, wonderful. And I have collected, I have collected um, a huge folder of articles that have been written about this um, painting because it's so mysterious. People come and they stand in front of the painting and some of them cry, some of them study it, some of them um, talk about it. And it's really fun for us to be in the museum when there's a docent talking about the painting. <laughs> and sometimes they talk about the psychological problems of these daughters because they did actually cross the ocean. They lived mostly in Europe and they crossed the ocean a great many times. And so, and because they weren't, none of the married people thought that they were just terribly psychologically messed up. Um, so it's, it's really interesting. And, and sometimes the images of the girls are put into other articles like a gardening article from Yankee Magazine. I picked up Yankee and there were two of the girls in a gardening article for children. So the mystery goes on. Well, I'm, I'm really fascinated. Uh, uh, what both of you have, have demonstrated actually ties in with a theme that we've heard um, in some of the, our other LexArt Inspires talks. And that uh, is actually part of what we're trying to do with this series is understand what are the, the connections uh, of, in different artistic media, uh, how, how people find, uh, find their inspiration. And so a couple of months ago, uh, a fiber artist, Meryl Camo, was talking about how she likes uh, her uh, phrase for it is mining memories. And I notice that both of you have done that um, with your own lives, your own families, and also you've explored uh, other families and, and other people. Um, and, uh, and this painting ties in with that as well. And so that is certainly a, a rich vein um, to be finding things. We do have another question um, from uh, Greg Lalas. Two things, and sons, myself included, are longtime musicians in rock and roll bands. They're, they're thrilled that the lyrics to the choral song start with, I will rock you, I will rock you. <laughs> <laughs> that, that must be where they got it, you know, holding them in, in the arms. <laughs> Does he have a question? <laughs> yes, uh, well, yes. He was just trying to soften you up with a little. Yeah, answer. right. Yeah, he did. <laughs> so, so, the question is, so uh, having been in a band with my brother, I would love to hear how you overcame the natural rivalry between siblings. <laughs> oh, that, that is funny. Um, there is no rivalry between our, us. And I don't think there ever really was. Um, I, I don't remember ever competing with Bundy. No, oh. Or, or Bundy with me. It's just always been, we've just always had a good time together. No, we just, we just competed uh, with Molly because she had all the boyfriends. <laughs> <laughs> we were in the library. We didn't compete. Very well. <laughs> what? What'd you say? We were in the library on Saturday night. All right. <laughs> 
Molly nice. was forever playing kick the ball or kick the can and and capture the flag with you know from a pretty young age. That never happened for Anne and me. <laughs> I think I think Greg Greg also or let's see Kate has one. How different is it collaborating with a sibling rather than a stranger? And that's that's a really interesting question. But there isn't that much of a difference because usually when you collaborate with a stranger, you know that person pretty well. At least that's been my experience. If somebody that I didn't know asked me to collaborate. That would I'd be curious about how it would work, but um, it would probably be fairly similar to the way Bundy and I have worked together. Just talking on the phone and changing things around and seeing how they work and then changing them back to the way they were sometimes and um, yeah. And so what what was it like it, um, to collaborate with the dancer on, on that uh, performance of your poem? That was really fun. She just came over to my house one day and um, let's see, I asked her if she would dance to one of my poems. And so she came over and looked at several of them and that one hit her immediately that that was the one she wanted to do. I don't know, is Cherise here by any chance? I don't know, maybe she's, if she is, she's probably muted, but I hope she is. Um, she uh, and and she she just knew that that was the one she wanted to do. It really spoke to her, and so and, and I had nothing to do with um, the of uh, the choreography. It was purely out of her mind. Oh, do we have um, other questions that people? Uh... I will say something. Sure. Yeah, this is Randall. Randall, who directed the play. Uh, yes, I. I that was my first. Um, direction of a full length play for New Surrey Theater. I've done scene work and different things like that before, but I met Bundy um, very briefly before her play had already been completed and so forth. So I'm an actor basically. And so working with Bundy at the beginning, I told her right away, I said, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm not a playwright or anything of the sort. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, I met Anne shortly after that, and we Zoomed together and talked um, through emails and, and such. Um, but I felt my job, and, I, and as I explained it to Bundy originally, was to respond to it from an actor's perspective. So a lot of the things that I tried to impart to them were based on an actor being on stage with their words. Um, which was a very interesting thing. I was terribly nervous because I had I didn't know these ladies and they turned out to be the most wonderful people in the world and they were so supportive and, and open to whatever suggestions we had. And I would just say like, well, as an actor, this to me would be more interesting or it would be more productive um, to get the story across. And, um, and uh, so all I can say is that part of the collaboration with two people that I had literally never met before was a marvelous experience. I don't think that's always the case though. <laughs> oh, we respected tremendously what Randall was telling us and especially as far as the language went. And, you know, here we are at our ages, the younger actors said, oh, no, 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 you can't say that. <laughs> that would never go. So we, we got it down pretty well, but Randall was a huge help. Well, and it looks like Charisse um, uh, has uh, popped into the chat and- Oh, uh, there she mm, is, good. I, I encourage you, you feel, feel free to unmute yourself if, if you'd like, but I, I noticed her comment is that Anne has such great trust in the creative process and gave me complete freedom to interpret her poem into dance. And uh, it sounds like a, a, a similar theme to uh, Randall's ex experience. And um, I think that isn't always the the case and and i just wonder um did did either of you feel any sort of tension between wanting to control your vision of your work versus allowing someone else to respond to it in in their own way was that was that difficult for you or what where do you find where do you find internally the strength to let other people do what they want with your work. The first thing that, oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, Bun. 
the first thing that came up was uh, Anne and I had decided that Kate was not going to be seen in this play. She was just going to be a voice. And Randall and the cast thought that she should be a real person. So Anne and I talked about this and then we went with Randall and we're so glad that we did. So it, well, it, what, one of the things that happened in that situation was that the, the man that I cast for Marco and the actor that I cast as Kate happened to be a couple and they lived together. So in the Zoom format where everybody's in their isolated um, boxes, I just had this vision that I thought it would be very interesting if they were actually in the same frame together from, you know, because the ghost of Kate would come into the frame and leave the frame. Sometimes she'd be speaking from off stage. So you'd hear this disembodied voice, but then the idea when she actually came in and took form with him that he, he spoke to her and, and communed with her, I thought it would be very interesting. I think it, and she was in period dress. She was the only one that wasn't in modern dress. So, and Nina Robinson Poole, who played that part, has this ethereal and timeless quality just visually. So I think she really pulled that off, the idea that she came from a different era, from a different time. Oh, it was magical. She really did pull it off. What, wonderful. So uh, Greg had another question, he, and he, want, he wants to know about, for the music collaborations, what comes first, the lyrics or the music? Um, the lyrics, actually. Actually, I, I used to write music, um, and, then, and then I did the lyrics, but it's much easier to do the lyrics and then the music, and that seems to work. What does Greg do? Does Greg, Greg White's music, does he? Yeah. <laughs> Greg, you want to unmute yourself and join in? Yeah, um, the, the melody comes first and then the lyrics. Oh, interesting. So I just read how um, for some poets, the rhythm comes before the words. Has that ever happened to you, Anne? The rhythm comes before the words. Um, well, I can I can see how that yes. might. Happen. Yeah, yeah, but it would no. I think they come simultaneously, for me. Yeah, they come at the same time. I think you can get a certain sense of of the the music that you want to write, and then, um, so you could either write the music or the the words. But um, even even if you write the rhythm, if you know the rhythm in your head. The words come quite easily. Well, uh, thank you, Anne and Bundy, for this wonderful, wonderful evening that you've you've shared with us. And of course, uh, spe very special thanks to Sister Molly, who suggested this wonderful program. Um, I'm uh, come to believe that nepotism is never not necessarily a bad thing. Bringing the family in can also uh, also be a wonderful, wonderful experience. And certainly this has been uh, for us. So thank you very much. Thank you to all the guests for uh, joining us. And um, please feel free to join us again uh, next month for our next LexArt Inspires with um, Guy Van Duzer and Billy Novick. And join us for anything else we've got going on at LexArt.org.